So hi, and welcome to Building Community with Social Media and NDSU Agriculture Communication uh, webinar. I'm Bob Birch, Web Technology Specialist with Ag Communication, um, and you can uh, reach me a number of ways, including my Twitter handle there, at NDBob. Um, I'm on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn as well, and uh, you can email me at robert.birch at ndsu.edu. I appreciate everybody joining uh, me today for this AgCom webinar, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about a theory of using uh, social media, um, maybe a strategy as well. Um, hey, Don, were you trying to talk? Um, yeah, if you don't have a question, John, you might, Don, you might want to mute your microphone. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of how my view um, of how we can take advantage of, of social media, uh, you know, in, in a number of aspects of our lives, but, but specifically uh, through our work with NDSU Extension Service. And so when we talk about building community in social media, it's really a just like building community anywhere, it's about relationships. It's about connecting uh, with people and connecting uh, people with one another. And the power in that um, uh, is part of how social media is made up. So, so it's important to remember that social media is not mass media. This is a mistake that everybody makes uh, or everybody has made. Um, especially corporations, organizations, extension services across the country, is that um, instead of approaching social media for what it is, um, organizations approach it as if it's another channel, right? So just like uh, radio or television or newspapers, um, that social media is just an extension of those things. And w what happens is just, you don't end up taking full advantage of the uniqueness of social media and uh, some of the things that you can accomplish there. So that's the first thing to remember. This is not mass media. This is not radio ads, newspaper columns, uh, television, any of the things that that uh, we've grown up as mo many of us have grown up with uh, in terms of, of mass communication. The real impact in using social media, in my view, uh, comes not from talking at people, but from connecting people with each other. Um, and that's really, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, it, it really comes out of the, what we call the multiplier effect. Um, and it also comes out of some theory uh, theories of collective action networks and how change really happens uh, in communities um, and how we can improve people's lives and communities as well. So this slide, you know, says one to one or excuse me, one to many communication, mass communication. That's what mass communication is, right? So uh, newscasters talking on TV. Uh, she is one person talking to multitudes of people. And in social media, that's not the ideal, but it's better than silence. Um, when we talk about social media, for, for some people, uh, Facebook, for instance, is the internet. It is where they get their news, it is where they get their information, and if you're not present there, um, that's a bad thing. Uh, it's like being a restaurant uh, and not having a website. For people who are from out of town, your restaurant does not exist. And so, um, even if you're going to do mass communication on social media, at least that's better than silence. At least it's better than not being there um, at all. Uh, because, like I said, for some people, social media is the Internet. But if you want to move one step further than that uh, and have a little bit more impact, one-to-one -one communication or personal communication is better than one-to-many communication. Okay, it doesn't mean that you that one replaces the other, um, but it's it's sort of a continuum so that you can strive for one-to-one -one communication, right? And I think we've all experienced this in our work. I can do a webinar like this. You can, I'm doing one-to-many communication now, right? I'm talking that to everybody, but maybe if one of you has a specific question and you call me tomorrow and we work together on your social media site, I'm probably gonna have a bigger impact on you in that one-to-one -one setting 
uh, than I am going to in a one-to-many setting, um, just because of the context, uh, you know, and then I can address your problem uh, directly. And we see that that possibility uh, exists in social media. We've we see it happen. We see it on the on the NDSU Extension Lawns, Gardens, and Trees page with people asking specific questions, horticulture questions, and those being answered in there. That is something that social media does that mass media doesn't do. Right? When somebody reads your column in the weekly newspaper, um, they they can't use the newspaper to respond back to you. You know, maybe they could place a, a classified ad or something that you might see uh, with their question in it. But this medium of social media uh, gives us that ability to do mass communication, yes, but also one-to-one -one personal communication. Even better, in my view, than, than the one-to-one -one communication is many-to-many uh, -many communication, right? So we've gone from one-to-many, that's mass communication, to one-to-one -to -one personal communication, and now to many to many, which is really social communication. Um, and this is where we can have the greatest impact when we're connecting not just with individuals, but we're connecting individuals with each other. And we get that multiplier effect, uh, that building of community capacity that can really have impact in our, in our communities and, and in our state. And social media is something that you know, this is something that's possible via social media. That's not possible via other uh, forms of media is connecting people with each other on those platforms. So that's really where um, we're striving towards, right? Is to building community, going from mass communication, uh, increasing the power of that with personal communication and in context, and then striving for this many-to-many -many social communication starting a conversation, building a community, connecting people with each other. Questions so far? Type them into the conversation, to the chat pod there. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. So how do you do that? How do you start connecting people with each other um, and create that many-to-many -many, uh, conversation and build a community? Um, one of the first things that you need to look for is the spark. Um, when you're doing mass communication, uh, we often don't think about uh, what connects the people that we're talking to because we don't really care. <laughs> they don't need to be connected. Well, all we care about is that they're listening to us. Um, but when you're going to connect people with each other and try and build a community, it's important to figure out what they have in common. What's that spark that will... Uh, ignite the community, ignite the conversation, the thing that they all care about, okay? Um, and so sometimes that's difficult to find. Uh, Brian Fredrickson from uh, University of Minnesota works uh, on some watershed issues, and so you might have uh, environmentalists at a table along with ag producers, um, and, and you want them to have a conversation. Well, in order for that conversation to take place, you need to find the spark. What is the thing that they both care about that they have in common, right? Otherwise, it's just gonna be an argument. But if you can find that spark, um, then you can potentially build some connections and, and possibly a community. So thinking about that when you're talking to people on social media, you, you know, is how could I group these people together? Maybe you're doing mass communication that results in some one-to-one -one communication and you realize, you know what, some of these people who are following my Facebook page, um, not all of them, but some of them are interested in this particular thing. How can I connect them with each other, build a community so that they can pursue that, uh, that desire, that desired change? Once you find the spark, it's important to define the goal, right? And this and this is something that is not necessarily up to you as an individual, as a person who's making the connections, but but to the community as a whole. Um, that's great. We all care about, you know, uh, revitalizing uh, our business community. Okay, that's great. But what's the goal? Like, what are we? How are we going to know if we actually did it? Um, goals and outcomes are something we're familiar with here, but that's important to have as part of a community because a conversation can go on. Uh, we could talk about how everybody cares about this, but if we don't have a shared goal, 
then we can't really take any collective action. Um, and so when you're building online communities, sometimes it's important to think about that. Um, even if it's not, uh, if you're not building an online community with the intention of, of actual physical action, still defining the goal of the community, saying we're here to share information and the result is that everybody can become smarter and learns from each other um, and we better define an issue, um, you know, that, that can be a way of defining a goal. But making clear why we're all together and what we're here to do uh, is important. You know, and then every community needs to have some kind of value proposition. Um, the individual members need to have need to get something back out of it. Uh, we'd like to live in an altruistic world where we're like, hey, let's all work together, you know, go, um, uh, you know, go uh, run a, a food pantry. It's great, you know, we're helping people, we're changing our community, um, but uh, as an individual. You, there has to be some value that you get out of that, even if it is the, the value of, well, it makes me feel better about myself. Um, but being clear about what that value proposition is, uh, is important to kind of sustaining that community. Because if, if individual members of an online community are not getting value back out of it, um, it's gonna fall apart uh, pretty quickly. And as you go through this process, um, it's important to realize that communities are emergent. And, uh, and what we mean by that is that uh, you, know, you, can, you can set out to create a particular kind of community, um, but you really don't have any control over it. As people get together and connect with each other, uh, a lot of their goals, desires, um, the things that they care about are going to emerge out of the conversation. And so, having some idea or some uh, roadmap or, or a future picture of what you expect to see um, is okay, but keep in mind your picture might not turn out that way, like the one on this slide, right? It might turn out, you might think it's going to be a nice landscape with everybody, everything realistically depicted, and then when the community actually gets together, um, you might end up with something abstract like the like the painting our stormtrooper is doing here uh, because the community is in charge. Um, once you start connecting people, ideas are going to emerge, feelings are going to emerge, uh, new issues are going to emerge, and it's going to kind of have a life of its own. And that's something that's Im important to kind of keep in mind, especially when we're, we're conditioned to have control of things, right? In our educational programming, for instance, like, hey, they're going to you know, or me in this webinar, I'm going to start on slide one and end on slide 39, and you're going to learn X, Y, and Z. Um, I can have that plan here and have some control over that potentially. Uh, in online communities or in communities in general, that's, that's hard to have. And in fact, it's impossible because the community is in charge. So how do we do this? Um, how do we work towards this idea of building community and social media? And one way to do it is to uh, work through a ladder of engagement. So when you think about interactions that are taking place via social media, whether that's on your on your Facebook page or on Twitter or uh, on LinkedIn, um, you might think of working people through or up a ladder of engagement. And so this is one potential ladder of engagement based a little bit on the work that Karen Jeanette has done with the Military Families Learning Network. Um, and, you know, it's one way that uh, that we could see a ladder of engagement. We might start at an engagement level of consuming, right? So that's very mass media. Someone's following your page, you do a post, they're like, oh, I, saw, I read that post. That's interesting. Um, and so they're very passive in that sense. And so the idea of a ladder of engagement would be to think specifically about uh, what can I do to move that person who's at the consume level up to the next level, whatever that level might be. And in this ladder of engagement, uh, you know, this that level might be to have them follow. Um, right. So they maybe see, saw your post on their Facebook news feed because somebody else shared it or something. Um, but maybe they haven't followed your page. 
um, or uh, they haven't uh, followed your Twitter account, um, or they haven't connected with your with your page on LinkedIn, or joined your group on LinkedIn, I should say. Um, so to get them to actually commit to that. So what can we do to move them from consume to follow? And then we might move up, you know, now we've got followers, that's great. Um, how can we make them commenters? Uh, why do we want to make them commenters? Um, because it's hard to start to connect with people with each other until we know who they are and start to get an idea of what they care about. And when they comment, we identify them, right? If they follow our page, um, we, we can't, you used to be able to look at a list of Facebook followers here, are the people who follow your, your page or like your page, you can't do that anymore. Um, so if you can get them to comment, now they become a person to us. If there's a name to go along with that follow. Um, and then you could potentially uh, work them up the ladder of engagement from there. So we would ask ourselves in, in a strategy, how do we move somebody from being a follower to being a commenter? Um, the next step in this ladder of engagement is share your story. The reason uh, we talk about share your story is um, because that's really how people connect with one another. Um, uh, Aaron Deering from the University of Minnesota uh, has a great quote, uh, and I think it's it's uh, true. And he says, uh, communities are built at the point where our stories intersect. Um, and that's how we make connections with each other, right? You're, you're having a conversation with someone, you know, maybe it's just the, you've, you've met them for the first time. It's the regular old stuff. Hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm Bob. I work at NDSU Ag Communication, blah, blah, blah. Boring old stuff. And then maybe all of a sudden I say, I've got, you know, three kids and, and two in college. And, and all of a sudden the person I'm talking to goes, what? Oh, I have kids in college too. Where do they go? You know, how was that transition for you to, to take your first one to college? You know, all of a sudden we share by sharing our stories, we found a point of connection where we can really uh, build that connection in a more deep way and move uh, towards, you know, becoming, uh, building that relationship and potentially building a community around that. So getting people not just to comment and say, great post or uh, cute picture or whatever, but moving them to that next step of engagement of sharing a little bit of them, of their story, uh, helps you build towards that community. Um, the next step there is join to actually have, um, you know, some kind of community that that people opt into. Um, you know, someone follows a Facebook page, they don't think of themselves as being part of a community. And not everybody who follows your Facebook page is going to be part of a, a given community that cares about uh, that spark or that particular thing or shares that goal. Uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, so there has to be an opt-in point where, where you ask people to join in, right? Maybe on another platform, maybe in a face-to-face -face meeting, um, if, they're, if that's geographically possible. Um, but they have to actually join the community. And then the, the big burst up there, um, that might remind you a little bit of the uh, transformational education burst in the top right corner, uh, of the of if you've ever seen the transfer transformational education uh, quadrants uh, is collaborate uh, and that that involves people working together in order to get people to work together there has to be trust so they have to have shared their stories they have to be connected in some way you can't just throw two strangers in a room um, and just say hey collaborate and you're going to get something that represents both of them uh, Schools make this mistake all the time, right? Let's, hey, let's work in groups, even though it might be three kids who dislike each other and then expect some kind of great product to come out of that. Um, those connections need to be made first, but but collaborates in the big burst there because that's where, uh, that's where all the good stuff comes. That's where we're able to scale our extension work uh, on a much greater level because it's not just being done by those of us employed uh, by extension, but by our partners in communities working together to to improve their own lives and communities. Um, that's where community capacity gets built. All kinds of great stuff happens when they start to work together. All right, I'm going to pause for questions. I hope there's questions because I'm running out of uh, breath.
Anyone to jump in? Comments? Anybody want to tell me I'm full of crap? Or has everybody left the meeting who has come to that conclusion? All right. I see you're typing, Kim. I'll, I'll, I'll let you type, but I'll, I'll move along slowly for the sake of the recording. Um, in the past, we've offered uh, some intro training to social media. We haven't done that for a long time, um, but we could. Um, so uh, let me know uh, if, there's a ne if there's a need for that. Um, there's a lot of information out there, you know, in terms of if you're looking for button pressing, like how do I set up a Facebook page or you know, how do I tweet or retweet? Um, and I could share some of those resources with you as well. Um, but yeah, so uh, we can, I think Sonia maybe has some of that stuff too on the uh, ag communication website. So maybe uh, Sonia's on, I see. So maybe you could share that link, Sonia, if you have a second. Yeah, uh, I just decided to put my mic on. I don't know why I just talked, but <laughs> um, I I was thinking too, like just today we talked about putting a job announcement up on Facebook and it was like three or four people later. Okay, so you go to your page? No, you go to a business page and how do you follow? And so it's just um, kind of reminders we're looking for how to do some of the basics, things like that. Sure. Yeah, and, and some of those resources are out there, and we can share them. Um, if you have a particular need or a training need, let me or Sonia know. We're happy to happy to help you out. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. So, I probably spent a little bit too much time on that ladder of engagement. So I'm going to talk about each step uh, individually here, but I'll, I'll try and be brief and move things along. So, you know, we're talking about that consume step um, and getting people to consume your stuff. How do you do that? Um, one, one way is that is to go out and find stuff to share, right? Um, nobody really is super likes the person who only talks about themselves. And that's true on social media too. Right. So if we're sharing things, not to pick on Kim, but if we're sharing things like job announcements or uh, awards we've won or, you know, look at us, 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 or, you know, uh, we'll talk about this later, but come to our event. You know, that's all stuff about us. And when you're, you're at a party, um, you know, people don't want to spend too much time with you if you're just talking about yourself. But if you have other stuff that you've learned from other people that you want to share, uh, sometimes that can be engaging. So one way to uh, to create consumable content is to go out and find stuff that uh, you think will interest people and then add value to it. And that's important, too. Um, for a long time, we've talked about uh, not just here in NDSU Ag Communication, but with some national work that I do with network literacy about not just hitting the share button, but adding some value to that. So when you see this, uh, MFLN tra Family Transitions post here, you'll see a couple of things. The, the link that is shared is not from MFLN Family Transitions. Um, it's from the U University of Minnesota system. And it's a report, um, a study that was done. And they could have just said, oh, you know, here's a study, put the title up and just click share. But instead of doing that, they added some value to it. And the, and the value they added was to uh, summarize the report and get to some of what it found right away. Um, and so, so it gives you an idea of what it's about and adds some value to it. So that is, that is consumable content. Go out and find something of interest and then add some value to it. So for sharing consumable content, how do we get people to follow? And one way is to ask without begging. Um, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, we'll talk about social capital and social capital withdrawals. One of the biggest social capital withdrawals there is please share this. Please like our page. Please follow us on Twitter. Um, all that stuff is, is social capital withdrawals. Um, 
And so you want, sometimes you have to ask, sometimes there has to be a call to action, um, but you want to do that without begging. So this is an interesting one from Subway um, where they're asking people to like this, um, but not saying like our post or share this post with your friends. Uh, just says like this if you wish you could spend your Sunday by the beach. Maybe seems a little bit tricky, but it's a way to get engagement without begging for engagement. So we've gotten them to follow uh, maybe our page or like our posts, get some engagement. How do we get them to comment? So one strategy is to ask targeted questions. Um, too many things, um, uh, too many times we're asking questions uh, at this stage in the ladder of engagement um, that people aren't ready to answer, right? So share your 4-H story. Well, some people might share their 4-H story. If they do, they are likely at a higher level on the ladder of engagement than at this comment level. The people who haven't reached this comment level yet probably aren't going to jump right into share their story, uh, share their 4-H story. They might need that intermediate uh, step. Um, and so a true false question like this from the military families, uh, military caregiving unit um, could be a way to do that, right? It's just simple, true or false. Medicare pays for long-term care, right? Also a teaching moment here because after people answer, right, you can do another post that uh, explains that you know tells them what the right answer was and uh, can provide some extra information um, as well. So asking targeted questions, yes or no, true or false questions that are simple to answer um, can get people to comment. And and why do we want them to comment? Because then we'll know who they are, right? We have a name, uh, a profile to go with, uh, the number of likes that we have on our page. So now we're here at the share your story uh, step and you can see the, uh, uh, the uh, quote that I gave earlier, um, at Chasing Seals, that's Aaron Deering's Twitter account. This is being uh, shared by somebody else who was at the same uh, Minnesota e-learning summit that I was at when I heard Aaron say this. Um, and so how do you get people to take that next step and share their story, well, you have to move them up the ladder of engagement first, right? So you don't create your Facebook page, hey, I got 30 followers on my Facebook page, and then you're like, hey, everybody, share your story. Um, you haven't done anything to move people up that ladder of engagement. They're probably not gonna be ready to be at that point uh, where they're ready to share your story. So doing the work, moving them up your ladder of engagement, whatever, however you define that ladder, um, there's some work that needs to be done to get them to get out there and share their story. Once you have at least some people prepared to do that, you know, then you can use uh, something like like this post from military uh, caregiving, um, where they are very specific about who their audience is, right? They're talking to caregivers. Um, they're not just talking to everybody. Um, and they are, you know, creating a post that really will connect with people. Um, and this one says, caregivers struggle to balance self expectations with what they can actually achieve. Find balance by starting with small things that you can change and then ask for what tip, what other tips do you have for caregivers? So asking the community to share tips for one another. So very specific, um, but pretty straightforward and clear question. It's not ambiguous, right? Um, but it allows them to talk about their own personal experience um, and to start to share their story with others, find that point of connection to build a community. And here are some of the results of that particular post. Uh, and I won't read them word for word, but short little things like take time to breathe, find a quiet moment, maybe not, so, not not much of a story shared there, but if you see that top one, um, that top one is getting to that person's story and has some things in there that people can connect with, right? We know that this person had children in the home, those kinds of things. And then the, the reply or the next uh, message right under that mentions children as well. 
So now we're talking about caregiving specifically around children. There's an opportunity for those two people to connect with each other, play off of one another. So join, how, how and where do you get people to join? Um, one option is to do some kind of Facebook group, right? So there are people who follow your page. Maybe it's military caregiving and they start talking about uh, caregiving for children uh, in a military setting. You we connect the two people that, that made those comments that shared their stories on the previous slide. Maybe we have some other people who uh, we can connect with each other as well. Um, now we need a space for them to talk. Um, so this is the NDSU Extension Service Innovation Group. It's a closed group. Um, so there's a little bit more um, trust that can be built there uh, because you're not working way out in the open. So people might be more willing to share a little bit more of their stories and how they feel and their opinions. Um, and so that would be one option, a Facebook group, a LinkedIn group, or maybe it's not an online space at all, right? Maybe if you're in a county uh, and it's geographically possible, maybe it's like, you know, hey, people who have been talking about this, what would you think about a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting? Um, but getting them to commit to something, to join some kind of group, to uh, sit, you know, single themselves out, or I shouldn't say single themselves out, but to commit to uh, a longer conversation of actually accomplishing something. And then collaborate. What does that look like? Here's one example that, that comes from the Military Families Learning Network as well. The Community Capacity Building uh, Concentration Area there does something called Friday Field Notes. And so they have guest bloggers. Um, so there's an example of people that they might discover through their work on social media, um, through building community, moving people up a ladder of engagement, and then uh, ask those people once they are to that, to that point to collaborate with the community capacity building uh, concentration area on a blog post um, from their, their particular point of view. Okay, so inviting people to collaborate um, is the strategy there, right? They're not, if you, you can connect them all and like throw them in a room or throw them in a Facebook group or whatever, and then sit back and wait for stuff to come out for collaboration to happen. And it's probably not going to happen. Um, that there has to be an invitation uh, to create something. And, and so that's what uh, community capacity building adheres to create Friday field notes and then actually invite people. Uh, to collaborate and contribute to that. Okay. So we talked about that ladder of engagement. This is an example of um, a, a social media strategy that has that ladder of engagement in mind. Um, this is from the Military Families Learning Network. Karen Jeanette created this. Uh, this drawing and you can see some of the stuff that we talked about uh, represented here right so in the in the left hand side where you see that seek circle you'll see some of the some of the keywords that we talked about like finding information right seeking out information and adding value to it um, following getting people to follow you um, asking targeted questions to move people along that ladder of engagement um, in the, in the sense area there in the middle, um, you'll see facilitating discussions um, and, and stories as well, getting people to share stories, to move them along that ladder of engagement. And then uh, in the last circle, in the share circle, that's where you'll see um, that collaboration, uh, the weaving stories together and those kinds of things. So social media strategies can look all different kinds of ways. I share this, this slide just because you might think of, of creating a social media strategy as, you know, uh, creating a, a document of some kind, two pages or, you know, uh, some kind of uh, traditional document that we might think of. Here's one that is uh, uh, sort of a doodle. Um, but I think it works as a strategy of how things are connected and how we're going to move people from one step to the other up that ladder uh, of engagement. Okay. 
So I want to I want to talk a little bit about social capital because it's an important concept as you're talk, as you're thinking about uh, moving people up the ladder of engagement and building community on social media. Social capital is a is a concept that's been around for uh, quite a while. And some of the people, if you're I don't know if anybody on here is uh, I see Carmen's on here. So if you're involved in community development, community vitality, you know we talk about social capital in terms of communities uh, a lot of time. As, as a way to try and quantify the connectedness uh, uh, and other things that uh, the kind of sense of community and different things that uh, really are, are different than hard capital, um, but still contribute to the success of community. Uh, here we're using it a little bit differently. And the idea is that um, in every relationship, in all your relationships, you have social capital and that that social capital can be built up um, or drawn down. Um, this is Tara Hunt. She wrote a book called The Wolfie Factor, which is all about social capital. Um, I encourage you to, to read it. It's a few years old now. Um, I don't know if it's been updated, so uh, you might see some anachronistic references to platforms. Uh, but the idea of social capital uh, still holds true, uh, even in our, in our current social media environment. So the idea uh, of social capital is that you can have social capital deposits. And uh, so just like a real bank account, and you would make those deposits um, by doing something that's going to earn you uh, some equity with people, right? Doing them a favor. So if we were talking about this in the real world, um, not in social media, uh, I might build up social capital by doing you a favor, right? Um, if, if we've just met and I ask you to come help rake my yard this weekend or, or tonight before it snows tomorrow uh, here in Fargo, um, and we've just met, you might be thinking, well, how, what right do you have to ask me for this favor? Like, we just met. You haven't built up any social capital with me, right? We don't really know each other. Uh, you haven't really ever shared anything with me. Um, so you might not do it, or you'd be less likely to do it potentially because I don't have any social capital built up with you. Um, so if I if I want people to, uh, yeah, if I want to be able to to draw on my social capital with people, I need to make deposits. So what are some things that are social capital deposits? Um, saying thank you <laughs> is a social capital deposit. Um, we use saying thank you as a as a small gift uh, in our working out loud circles. If you want to learn more about those, you know, let me know. Um, we've got some coming up uh, uh, in January. Um, just saying thank you, thank you for your work, thanks for writing that, thanks for your note. Um, on social media, that just might be thanks for your comment, right? Thanks for liking our page, uh, or maybe not Facebook page, but like if someone likes your Twitter account, thanks for liking my account. That's a really easy, simple social capital deposit saying thank you to somebody. Um, we talked about consumable information. Consumable information uh, can be a great social capital uh, deposit, right? Sharing information that is uh, that you've added value to um, and especially information that's actionable. I really like actionable information as a social capital deposit, something that I can use right now, right? So a lot of times we might share stuff uh, on our social media accounts that are sort of big picture stuff, you know, that um, you might need to think about for a while or might inform your future decisions. Um, and those are okay, but really good social capital deposits uh, can be things like recipes that are actionable, right? And not everybody, recipes is not going to fit everybody's content on social media, but it's a good example of that. So think of things like that. What things that I can take action on right now, uh, you know, to make my life a little bit better. Um, so those are social capital deposits or examples of some social capital deposits. So there are also social capital withdrawals. Uh, social capital withdrawals are any time that you're asking for attention um, uh, or for people to do stuff, right? Help me rake my leaves this weekend. That's a social capital withdrawal. On social media, it's things like, uh, please fill out my survey. Please share this post. Uh, please attend my workshop. 
Um, all of those kinds of things are social capital withdrawals. That doesn't mean that they're bad, right? It just means that you want to have enough deposits in your account before you make too many withdrawals. You, know, you want to keep a positive balance. If, if you are out on social media and you're always asking people on social media to do stuff for you and saying, look at me, look at me, do this for me, come to my event, all that kind of stuff, and you're not making deposits, uh, you're going to lose those people. They're just going to stop. They're not going to engage. You're not going to be able to move them up the ladder of engagement, and they're just going to stop paying attention. Um, so that's the idea of social capital and keeping that that positive balance is important so a few more just high level things about social media that we get a lot of questions about and one is uh, about choosing platforms almost everybody is on Facebook I can't I think Pew just uh, the Pew Internet Research Center um, just released some new numbers and I want to say it's something like 78 percent of all online people are on Facebook um, which is much more than any other platform um, so Facebook is sort of a given. Um, it's sort of like having a website, um, being on Facebook in, in some way. There's, there's just so many of the online people are there. Um, so that's kind of a given. But what other platforms? You know, Kim mentioned Instagram in the, in the chat. You know, and there's Snapchat out there if you, if you want to consider that a social media uh, platform. Um, uh, lots of other ones. How do you choose which ones to participate in? Um, well, one, it, one way to do that is to start with your content. What fits your content? Um, Facebook takes a lot of content. It's going to fit most content. Twitter, not so much. Yeah, you can share photos, you can share videos, but the 140 character limit um, you know, could get in your way uh, in terms of the types of content that you might want yeah, you might want to share. Um, Instagram. Instagram is photos and videos. If you have a lot of text-based content, you maybe don't want to be on Instagram or at least have it as a high priority in your platform. So choosing a platform, um, one of the things to think about is what fits your content. Where's your audience? Um, even though almost everybody's on Facebook, uh, you might not, that, that still might not be the right place to communicate with your audience and and do the things that you want to do, especially in terms of building community, um, you know. And so one example of that might be if you're sharing fast-paced information, uh, things that change on a daily basis. Um, you know, maybe Twitter is a little bit better for that. People tend to use Twitter for more newsy things, um, and if your audience is there, then then maybe that's where you want to be. And there might be certain subgroups in there that. They might be on Facebook in terms of having accounts, but maybe they don't use it often, and and they're more active in other um, in other platforms. We talk about young people kind of leaving Facebook. Um, that's been a narrative for a couple of years now. So if you're trying to reach younger people, then Snapchat or Instagram potentially could be a better platform for you. So, what fits your content? Where's your audience? Those are two important questions to ask. Uh, also important, where are you comfortable? Um, biggest mistake, or, or met, I should say many of the mistakes that we see corporations make are the results of not being aware of the culture of a particular social media platform. So um, Twitter tends to be uh, a place where people are pretty irreverent. Uh, and so uh, sometimes corporations will get out on Twitter and start a hashtag around something and then the community will co-opt that hashtag in order to make fun of that particular brand or that particular corporation right so um, if you're gonna be on Twitter that's something that you need to be aware about aware of that there that that culture exists out there um, and be comfortable with how to interact uh, in that culture um, along with kind of the things that Kim brought up right knowing how to post um, being comfortable with, you know, making sure that stuff goes on the right account or on the right page and those kinds of things. So uh, it's much better for you to start somewhere where you're comfortable or to get comfortable on a platform before you jump in and like, hey, I just started my Twitter account. I want to get 20 tweets out before, you know, the end of the week. Um, you might want to take some time to get comfortable with the, with the culture of that particular platform. Um, 
We talk about avoiding walled gardens. Uh, this is less of a less of an issue anymore. Uh, lots of things are pretty open now. Uh, there used to be um, a lot more activity on uh, what we call private social networks. Um, some things like Ning, for instance, if anybody's heard of Ning. Um, but one of the reasons that uh, we like to avoid walled gardens is because we don't want to close off the conversation. Now, when we talked about online communities and having something like a closed Facebook group, once you get to a certain point with, with a community, maybe they need to be in a walled garden, uh, somewhere where they feel more comfortable, where they can share more openly, where there's more trust and privacy, um, that, that's okay. But starting your social media presence in a walled garden uh, sort of sets you up for failure. It's hard to get people in for instance, so starting a private Facebook group as your social media presence, it's hard to get people into the group uh, and recruit them into the group. Um, and then you lose uh, serendipity. You, you lose some of the, uh, the possible, accessing the possible when you're in uh, a walled garden. And if you're out in the open, uh, anything is possible. You don't know who's potentially going to follow or comment or connect with you. And those unknown connections could open new doors of possibilities that you didn't know existed before. Okay, wait for the slide to advance. I don't know if you guys are seeing a different slide. I'm seeing the same slide. We're still seeing open worlds equals anything is possible. Or, yeah, there's been a couple you've been sliding through. Okay, I'm not seeing them. We're so. on the one that says listen with a little. All right, thanks, dude. Kim. Yeah, <laughs> <with the> earphones. <laughs> um, yeah. So how do you how do you get comfortable? How do you find out about a, a particular platform? Well, one way is to listen. Um, and so uh, I encourage you if you're considering being active on a platform, whether it's uh, professionally or personally. Uh, to get out there and listen for a while and um, kind of get a sense of uh, what the culture is around that particular uh, platform. You know, and so I, I use this party analogy a lot. It's a common one with social media, but when you come into a room uh, that you're not familiar with, uh, with a group of people that you're not familiar with, you don't just, you know, come in and start shouting, you know, hey, everybody. I've got a body joke to tell you um, because you haven't gauged the you haven't gauged the room. You know, is this a formal environment? Is this an informal environment? Are these people, uh, you know, Quakers or are they uh, hippies or whatever? I don't know. Um, but listening can tell you that stuff. OK, so uh, listening is important. I'll go back for a second here. Listening is also important from the standpoint of building community, right? If you're going to get people to engage with you uh, and potentially connect them with each other, if you're not listening, actively listening to what they're saying, um, you're not you're going to miss those opportunities, um, right? If you just we showed that uh, example from military caregiving where they got people to share their stories. If you're not attentive to that, you've missed that opportunity to connect those two people who uh, seemed interested in caregiving for children in a, in a military setting um, because you're, all you're focused on is how many likes did I get and oh, look at all the comments and you're not, you're not reading them, you're not listening to what people are saying. So from that standpoint, listening is important as well. Um, don't feed the trolls. Uh, this is this was less of a loaded slide uh, pre-election than it is post-election, um, but it but it's still important to keep in mind. Um, if you don't know what trolls are, it's people on the internet who are out there just to do uh, just to do harm, uh, just to goad people, just to hurt people, just to say hurtful things. Um, and one of the one of the one of the uh, platitudes of of social media is don't feed the trolls, don't engage them. Okay. Um, it's also important to make sure that you're attentive to being able to tell the difference uh, between a, what's a troll and what's just somebody who disagrees with you, right? So especially if you're active in a in a in a potentially controversial area, climate or or uh, you know uh, 
livestock, and almost any of our areas could be potentially controversial, I guess. Uh, you know, everybody's got their own uh, opinions. Um, so engaging someone who disagrees uh, in an honest and open and respectful way is great. Um, but if it's somebody who's just out there to do harm, engaging them just encourages them and gives them what they want, which is attention. Um, and so it's better to delete, ignore, uh, get rid of that stuff. Um, but we have had a few instances where, um, you know, it might be hard to tell what's trolling and what is just honest disagreement. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is to have a conversation about that, right, with somebody. You can contact me uh, or, or Becky Koch and AgCom. You can contact uh, your district director, contact um, you know, one of the assistant directors and have a conversation about it before uh, sort of jumping in on, you know, well, this is troll. I'm just going to delete that comment or um, or engaging somebody over a disagreement if you're unsure of what you're what you're actually dealing with. OK. So we're back to share your story again, because, you know, if if um, if you're going to ask people to share their stories, you you have to share some of your own. Um, and when we say that, that means that there has to be people behind the organization, right? People are not friends with organizations or friends with corporations. Uh, they are friends with other human beings. And so you have to be present in that. It doesn't mean that it, all, that it has to be personal at all, if you don't want it to be, but it can be your story as a professional. But we have to have people present uh, in our social media, uh, in NDSU Extension Service and whatever organization or, or company that is, that is using social media. Um, we, people have to realize that there, are, that there are people on the other side of it. It's not just corporate speak. It's not just uh, the Fargo campus or however they envision um, the organization. And so being open, sharing a little bit of your story um, is, a, is important for connection and it's important to move people up that ladder of engagement. All right. I hope that's what you saw with Share Your Story because I still am seeing the open world side, but this should be the question slide. Questions. Question slide with some out of date social media platforms like Google Plus out there. So these are your personal ones, Bob? Yep, yep. Oh. Uh, you can also find AgCom Web Services on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, just search NDSU AgCom Web Services. Um, AgCom is on Twitter, not actively, um, but uh, we do have a Twitter account as well. Uh, so Carmen's asking about German Russian country prairie legacy Facebook page and some ideas uh, to to build some engagement even though there's there's lots of likes out there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that, uh, Carmen. Um, I would I would go ahead and, and think about some of those examples we gave from gave from Military Families Learning Network this the from, on the slides earlier and and think about how. Uh, we might actually get some engagement there. And maybe you guys have been doing that stuff. Maybe you've been asking some targeted questions and those kinds of things. Um, but I, I'd be happy to uh, take a look. Yes, and I, I have seen those posts too, Sonia. Um, yeah, uh, I am I am of that heritage. So Nephla and, and cheese buttons and things uh, make me homesick, so. Okay. I'd be happy to take a look, Carmen, and we can have a, let's meet and talk about it. Other questions, concerns, disagreements? Cute PowerPoint. PowerPoint slides, I mean. <laughs> Thanks. The, the little figures. Yeah. Yeah, I should probably get my should probably get my uh, attributions up here. Wow. 
no, not all the Lego people are mine. Some of them are are from uh, from my home and my son Aiden, but uh, many of them from Flickr with the through Creative Commons licensing. So. Sorry, Christina. I disappoint again. Oh, quit that. <laughs> All right. Well, well, if you want to, you know, uh, like Carmen asked, if you want to talk about what you've been posting, how you could get more engagement, um, and those kinds of things, uh, either Sonia or I are happy to meet with you anytime. Uh, please contact us. That's what we're here for. Um, and I hope that uh, you'll think about this a little bit. Uh, good Thanks, idea Bob. for Tony. Yeah, no problem, Kim. Thanks for attending. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Christina. That sounds that sounds cool. I'll be anxious to see um, what comes out of that photography project. You're welcome, Tom. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, Don. All right, thanks everybody for attending. I'm gonna stop the recording.